Danny Hamlin wants everyone to forget about that one Richmond restart. Joey Gase's bumper throw is going to cost him. And Chase Briscoe says he's in a contract year. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove. So many questions surround Stuart Haas Racing. Will they lose their tier one status with Ford? Could they switch manufacturers altogether? If so, how does this impact the drivers? According to yesterday's report, Stuart Haas may be looking to sell one or more charters. Any conversation about Stuart Haas racing right now is complicated. There are numerous layers to parse through. Yesterday, I stumbled across a clip from Motorsports on NBC uploaded to YouTube. I'll link it down in the description below. Chase Briscoe discusses a variety of topics, but about midway through, he mentioned that he's in a contract year, which kind of surprised me because just last January, January 2023, he signed a multi-year deal with Stuart Haas, a deal that Tony Stewart said at the time would keep Briscoe in one of their cars for many years to come. That was just over a year ago. He's already in another contract year. Anyway, here's the quote from Chase Briscoe. This is a huge year for where my career is going to go. If I struggle this year, I could honestly fizzle out of the Cup Series and NASCAR in general. I'm not a rookie anymore. I'm not inexperienced. I need to go out and show that I can run good on a weekly basis. It's an option year for them. It's up to them if they want to keep me or not. I've been super happy being here. I've been a Ford driver and at Stuart Haas for five years now, so it feels like home to me. Huh, he says them. It's up to them. He mentions Ford, he mentions Stuart Haas. Again, with rumors suggesting Stuart Haas Racing may switch manufacturers at year's end or could potentially lose their tier one status with Ford, I wonder how that may impact Chase Briscoe's role with the team. Let's just assume that Chase Briscoe is a Stuart Haas driver first. I would be shocked if SHR let him go. You know, Mahindra has come on board, been a huge supporter. High Point has been a loyal Briscoe partner for years. Chase Briscoe has a Cup Series win. He's made a deep playoff run, got to the round of eight in 2022. Really, for most of the past two years, I think he's been the second best Stuart Haas racing driver behind Kevin Harvick. This year, he's 18th in points, which isn't great, but it's best of the team. Unless he crashes and burns this year or his major sponsors pull out. I don't see any good reason why Stuart Haas would let Chase Briscoe go, but I guess we'll see. Maybe his contract is with Ford, and if Stuart Haas and Ford are on the outskirts, I don't know where that leaves Chase Briscoe. Things could get uncomfortable quickly. So again, we'll have to wait and see, but I just wanted to share those comments from Chase Briscoe, kind of an interesting follow-up to the discussion we had on the show yesterday. Joey Gase went viral Saturday afternoon. He was involved in a crash during the Xfinity Series race at Richmond. He ripped his rear bumper cover off and chucked it at Dawson Cram's Chevrolet. A viral moment that's been shared and memed to death the past few days. Now it's going to cost Joey Gase. Today, NASCAR announced they have fined Joey Gase $5,000. They cited a rule that says he created an unsafe environment that poses a, a threat to the safety of his competitors. It's just $5,000, but you know, that is real money to a smaller Xfinity Series team like this, especially considering Joey Gase already went home with tens of thousands of dollars worth of damage, most likely. I know over the past decade or so, NASCAR has heavily frowned upon drivers walking across an active racetrack. It's a safety concern. They want drivers to stay by their vehicle, wait for the safety crews. Obviously, Joey Gase walked you know, pretty far down the racing groove, forced traffic to check up. So I get why NASCAR wouldn't like that. You know, I'd have to look at recent examples. I know when Bubba Wallace and Kyle Larson crashed, and then you know, Bubba confronted Larson on the front stretch at Las Vegas, NASCAR suspended Wallace because of what he did on the racetrack. Nothing to do with him walking up and confronting Larson. I can also think of an example, was it last year, right? When Austin Dillon chucked his helmet at somebody at Pocono? He did not get a penalty for that. Tony Stewart, 10, 12 years ago, didn't get a penalty for uh, throwing his helmet at Matt Kenseth. No fine, no anything. So, you know, considering past precedent, I kind of wish they'd let this go. But, you know, again, he did walk pretty far down into traffic. A $5,000 fine, I get it. I get it. I, I may not have handed it out, but I don't think that's, you know, an egregious or unfair penalty. A memorable moment for sure. I think I saw somewhere that this clip made it onto, like, Colbert or one of those late night shows. So... I guess that's cool. Anyway, you know what else is cool is a brand new NASCAR console video game. It's been 
Oh my gosh, it's been since 2021 since Ignition was released? Gosh, time has flown by. Today, iRacing released this image teasing the new NASCAR console video game that's currently in development, expected to release in the fall of 2025. So still a ways away, but pretty cool to see you know, a glimpse of you know, the work in progress. A fun, quality NASCAR console video game would do wonders for the sport. It would engage with younger potential fans in a way that few other things possibly could. So I hope whatever iRacing is cooking up is something great. Still got a ways to weigh before we'll get to play it, hopefully. But you know, maybe when it comes out, we'll bring back some of those old you know, NASCAR gaming streams on this channel. A little throwback. In front of us! But these fans are having a good time. Right. Yeah. Hey, you get, mind getting me a taco from that truck? Ah, all right. I know I said we were done talking about this. I want to be done talking about this, but I'm sorry. New information keeps coming out. Elton Sawyer was trending on my Twitter feed yesterday. I know many of us probably feel the same way Denny Hamlin does in this tweet. I sure wish someone would come out with a new paint scheme or something. Ain't y'all tired of talking about the same thing for 48 hours now? Our team won the race because of the pit crew, not the restart. Y'all just sour. Get over it. Hey, you know, someone did come out with a nice new paint scheme. Check out this uh, solid gold mobile one scheme for Josh Berry this weekend at Martinsville. That's, that's pretty cool. Okay, now back to business. Denny Hamlin's right. His pit crew does deserve the most credit for getting him the victory at Richmond. I made sure to spotlight them during my post-race episode Sunday night. But unfortunately, the only way we're going to stop talking about that final restart is if NASCAR stops talking about that final restart. NASCAR VP of competition Elton Sawyer clarified his serious comments yesterday on NASCAR Race Hub FS1. Here's what he said, quote, I still stand by the call we made at the track. When you're going to take a race from someone, you better feel like you're 100% accurate and confident in the call. If this happens on lap 40, 50, or 300, when we have the opportunity to take more time to review it and be 100% accurate and confident we're making the right call, we'll make the right call. The sense of urgency at the end of the race to get the winner correct, but also to get him to victory lane, etc. the sense of urgency is higher at the end of the race. That doesn't mean we don't make that call, but we better be 100% confident when we make it. <sighs> okay, okay, let's make this quick. My final Richmond restart take. This week, I've seen numerous clips from past Richmond races where drivers jumped the restart. This just must be a Richmond thing, I guess. You know, many of those were not called, like this clip of my boy Matt Kenseth in 2015. Gosh, he jumped way before that first white line. No call. He went on to win the race. But some drivers were penalized for jumping the start, like Carl Edwards in 2012. He got a penalty for this. All anyone asks for is consistency, and I get that's difficult sometimes. I don't agree with folks calling this a, a balls and strikes call. You know, the strike zone in baseball is invisible. It's not like on TV where ESPN puts that nice little box there. You know, the umpire does not have a little box in front of him. In NASCAR, we have a clear line on the wall, on the track that's visible to everybody. This call in NASCAR should be more black and white than it is, apparently. I'll concede that I'm okay with a very thin gray area. If Denny Hamlin hit the gas you know, three feet before the restart zone, I'll probably look the other way. And there's other ways judgment can come into play. You know, did Martin Truex Jr. lay back? Yeah, I don't really think so. Maybe a tiny bit. Did Joey Logano lay back in row two? Yes, he did at first, but then he kind of closed that gap, got right to Hamlin's bumper well before the restart zone, lost some of his momentum, which is why when Hamlin took off, Logano was left in the dust. So I don't really think that could be an excuse either. So I will concede it's not perfectly black and white. There is a thin gray area we can play with. The problem with Sunday night is that Denny Hamlin didn't jump the start by three feet. He jumped the start by at least 13 feet. Again, I understand NASCAR not wanting to call a penalty that clouds their you know, exciting overtime finish. And I understand that there is a sense of urgency to declare the winner, do the front stretch interview, get them to victory lane, start post-race ceremonies, all that. But that shouldn't stop NASCAR from making the correct, consistent call. Again, NASCAR in the past has been willing to make these hard calls at the end of races. We've had to wait while they review double yellow line incidents at super speedways. Like I said, they hit SVG with a course cutting penalty at the end of last weekend's race at Coda, which cost him a second place finish. They've been willing to make these hard calls at the end of races before, so why not now? Why not here? All we ask is for NASCAR to try and be consistent. 
That's it. That's all. That's the last I'm going to talk about this on this show at least until the next restart controversy. (laughs) Anyway, share your thoughts down in the comment section below. What do you make of Chase Briscoe's Stuart Haas racing future? What happens there? Uh, What about the fine to Joey Gase? Fair, foul, neutral? Let me know how you feel about that one. And Elton Sawyer, he just keeps talking. Do you agree with NASCAR's rationale? Do you at least understand maybe where they're coming from? Let me know down in the comment section. That'll do it for this episode, y'all. Leave a like if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new to the channel. Channel. Really appreciate the support, and I also appreciate the support from all of you on Patreon. It really means the world to me. I'll be live tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern time right here on this channel. Be sure to stop by. Hope to see you there. Have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday afternoon, folks. I'll see you again real soon.